This episode of Out of Spec Reviews is brought to you by Magna. More on that later. Hi, Jordan here with Out of Spec Reviews. Does owning an electric car automatically make you a forward thinker? And does being an electric car automatically mean you are of the future? Well, I'm in a bit of the past right here. This is the Nissan Leaf, which has now been in production for over a decade. It actually predates the Model S. And I kind of wanted to see how it actually stacks up today. Um, you know, the original tagline when the Leaf came out was, Innovation for the planet, innovation for all. So I sought out to answer whether that tagline still applies to the Nissan Leaf. So in determining whether or not the Leaf is still innovative, um, you really have to have context in mind. The price is a big one. This is an electric car that can be had for under 20 grand, technically speaking. That's including the federal tax credit, which may not last forever. But it starts at 27.4. This one is actually spec to right about 40. And in true fashion, most of our press cars are um, relatively top of the line because they really want to show us everything they can offer. But uh, me and Kyle are unique in the fact that we really like to have base models. So unfortunately, this is not a base or standard um, S. Um, but this is the SL Plus, which is top of the line. That's big battery pack. Every option you can have has been added, which uh, still no sunroof. Oh, and this comes in that beautiful Sunset Chroma, dr wait, Sunset Drift Chroma Flare orange. Um, Kyle had this, of course, in the fall when the leaves were actually orange and it was awesome and it made sense. But what a wild color name. They have the audacity to use the word drift in the name of a Nissan Leaf. That's interesting. But let's take a look at the technology. That's what I wanted to primarily focus this video on is, you know, electric cars are typically considered innovations of tech. And I want to see if this has any sort of tech to stack up against the competitors. But again, that important word context, because this is also so much cheaper than the competitors. So what do you get with the Nissan Leaf? Well, a lot of things have stayed the same uh, with the original, which is the, let's see, 2011 was the first model year. Not a lot has changed, but it has been updated a bit to fit in with modern Nissans, more or less. Um, the screen is an 8-inch screen. It's okay. Definitely some such uh, separation between the screen and the actual glass. It's not super responsive. It's a bit glitchy, um, but it works. And it is uh, actually capacitive, so not resistive, which is nice. And it's, uh, yeah, eight inches full color. And then there's a display in front next to the gauge cluster, which is, I think, a bit bigger than the original one. And also not amazing. You can definitely tell it's not like OLED or anything like that from some modern cars. And it shows you a lot of information. You have driver assist here and forward, lane, blind spot, miles per hour, tire pressure, which is great, and drive computer. And chassis control <laughs> and there's a bunch of other things you can set like um, driver assistance vdc which kyle played with on his important um, performance driving evaluation of this and there's just a lot you can adjust on here of course the power meter you can see what you're listening to compass and see what your miles per kilowatt hour are which i've actually been getting decent numbers um, sometimes over four so it's definitely a fairly efficient vehicle. And then of course over here is just the speedometer. So nothing too crazy. You just get what you need basically. The steering wheel, funny enough, has a flat bottom for that performance driving and lots of steering controls, nice buttons. Uh, they like, they work. I feel like all the touch, um, what's it called? Switch gear, all the switch gear in here is actually Functional, it's just not premium in any way, especially these heated seat things. I mean, they've been using this for a long time in Nissan and Infiniti products. This even looks a little cheap, but again, it's a it's a cheap car. So just plastic everywhere, a little bit of leather type stuff, but even that doesn't feel very great. And actually over here, I wanted to point out, this is tiny. I mean, 
can't fit like anything in there. And it extends barely onto my side as a driver. My elbow is just on the very edge of it. But the passenger side, they don't even get to use it. It's literally cut out to match the seat. So no left armrest for the passengers, unfortunately. The seats have a cool suede material. But um, the audio system, this is the premium, you know, the SL Plus, and it has the Bose, which is a seven speaker, um, what do they call it? Energy series? Yeah, I think it's the Energy series that Bose actually developed with the Nissan Leaf, with Nissan back for the original Leaf. I don't think it's really been changed since then. At least all my research says it has not. So it is a seven speaker system. You've got tweeters there and there. And then in each door, you have a mid bass woofer driver. And then the trunk, which I'll show you in a second, has a um, bass box, I guess they call it. I couldn't figure out what exactly they wanted to call it, but it's a it's a box of sort of bass channels to get those low frequencies without using an actual subwoofer speaker. Now, a lot of TVs have used that in the past, uh, especially Bose. I think Bose may have pioneered that aspect or that concept, and it does provide some decent bass frequencies and uses less force less energy so the whole idea behind the sound system is to be much more energy efficient in fact when it came out a comparable system uses twice the energy as this one does so that was pretty awesome and definitely innovative for the time and the fact that they've just kept using it doesn't mean they're not innovative it's just you know don't fix it if it ain't broke and as far as sound quality goes it's actually really quite good um, for a Bose especially, I'm not always the biggest fan of Bose. I've had them in a number of cars, and they're always decent. But for this kind of car, an economy hatchback, um, it really does work well. Now, the treble and bass, I have I have treble boosted a tiny bit. Bass just left kind of in the middle. Otherwise, it can kind of uh, get overpowering, but not in a good way. So I wish that you had like a bit more adjustment in the EQ. I wish there was like a five band or at minimum a three band but you can make do with the two band and know that it sounds pretty decent. The actual sound quality is, like I said, good, but it could be much better. But again, context, I just keep having to think this is a cheap car. It doesn't need to be amazing um, because it's not. Um, seven speakers is not very much for a premium audio system. And you have decent clarity. The highs tend to fall apart in the upper levels, especially in the back seats. Only the front seats have those tweeters, which are even then way in front of you. So the back seat doesn't get as good of an experience as the front seat. And you can even feel the boomy bass a little bit. And even the placement of the subwoofer, I think is not, uh, or sorry, sub box, is not really optimal if you ask me. I don't know where else they would put it, but it's definitely something that can be in the way of you putting things into the trunk, depending on the size of those things and how much trunk space you need to use. Uh, I think it's a pretty sturdy box, so you should be able to put stuff on top of it, but then again, will that rattle the things you put on top of it? I don't know, <laughs> but it's not like my favorite situation for audio, but it impressed me. It was better than I expected. I came into the Leaf with honestly pretty low expectations. You know, it has a a stigma around it, similar to the Toyota Prius, but I'm a fan of the Prius. I think it's a genuinely good car, and the more I drive this and interact with the Leaf, the more I think this is the electric Prius. This episode is proudly brought to you by Magna. Magna is a mobility technology company that is super unique because they touch every aspect of almost every car in the market, especially a lot of electric vehicles, and they pr even can produce vehicles from the ground up. Now, you may remember I shot a series just recently testing some of their new electric vehicle powertrains, so stay tuned for a lot of Magna content to come. We're going to be going in-depth with some really interesting topics with these guys, and Out of Spec wants to thank Magna for sponsoring this review, and tons of other videos to come right here on Out of Spec. We look forward to working with Magna to define and find out what the future of mobility looks like. So here's the Monroney if you want to take a look, but the um, the base price is $37.4, so this starts at $10,000 more than the um, non-SL Plus, I guess the, the S. And uh, with the Plus, I guess we can talk trims really quick, you you get the bigger battery, uh, yeah, the bigger battery, which is 62 point, uh, no, 62 kilowatt hours. And that does theoretically, according to Nissan's website, give you 226 miles of range on the EPA. 
So this says 215. I think it's outdated because the EPA test finally went through. So 226 is totally usable. I mean, that's, that's as good as some cars that cost twice as much. Now, the standard battery, so the S or the SL, not the plus, can only do about 150 miles. That's a 40 kilowatt hour battery, um, which is, you know, in theory would charge a bit faster because it's a smaller battery. And for a lot of people, that's enough. I mean, I've calculated, even with my commuting up to Fort Collins to see Kyle, I could actually make use of a standard leaf. So this is the second generation, came out in, a, uh, yeah, about 2017. So... Um, it definitely looks better than the first one, if you ask me. They've made some improvements, and I just hope they keep making improvements. There's a lot that still could be changed, and that, as we see more cheaper electric cars into the market, the importance and uniqueness of the Leaf is going to start to wane, because they really haven't caught up with the rest of the fleet, if you ask me. There's just a few things they could work on, especially the switch gear and the ui just it doesn't feel like the future it feels like an economy hatchback that has been electrified which really is kind of the point there is no wireless carplay no wireless android auto um, no wireless phone charger which honestly is not the best way to charge a phone anyways um, but you're just you're missing out on some cr crucial features i think would be beneficial to really make it innovative especially like imagine if the leaf today had wireless carplay and android auto when the future thinking EV6 and Ionic 5 don't. That's a missed opportunity if you ask me. It does have a single USB-C port, um, but also USB-A, which is the main, and there's two USB-A ports in the back seat, so only one USB-C port. That's a, also a bit of a drawback. I understand half and half, but having the only USB-C port in the front when your kids, who theoretically should be the most forward-thinking of all, are sitting in the back wanting to charge their USB-C devices. Sorry. The shifter's a little weird, too. I wish they would have just used a normal shifter, maybe. Um, it, I don't know why electric has to be weird. Kyle thinks it's kind of cool. I guess it can be, but I don't like it that much. Um, but it is cool that this, the premium higher-end Leafs get the 360 camera, the parking sensors, the kind of adaptive driving, which we'll talk about in just a bit. But uh, it it works, but not the best 360 camera, not the best shifter. But again, context, it's a good price. And then you have the rear mirror that has been used in various Japanese products for over a decade, I think 15 years is how long they've been using this mirror. That is not innovative, but at the same time, you can't really change a mirror that much. It actually works fairly well with the interior as far as the design. Um, so I'll give this a pass, but Nissan using this rear mirror and their brand new, completely redesigned Pathfinder with all edgy stuff inside, that's not a pass. But for the Leaf, it, it works, that's fine. So I'm gonna go charge this bad boy up and talk about some of the other limitations, especially around charging. So let's talk about some driver assistance systems. Um, it does have e-pedal, as you can see right there. And it's all right. It's a one-pedal driving vehicle, which comes standard on even the base model. And that's kind of cool, actually. I like that it's not an option. Um, and it's cool that you can get a one-pedal driving car at that low cost. As far as usability, the heated seats and heated steering wheel are good, even though I complain about the switch gear. Um, this one's fine, it's just right there. And they actually work pretty well, and they're not too hot, which I can't say for many things. Typically when a car has heated seats, I will use it on the lowest or middle setting. And with this, even on high, which I have it on low right now, but even on high, I can tolerate it just fine. And the heated steering wheel does not make me want to shut it off after a few minutes because it's like a almost burning sensation. So those are actually well implemented. As far as driving modes go, you really just have eco on or off, which when I turn it on, it really adjusts the throttle response. Uh, so it makes you have to dig a bit deeper into the floor to really get going. Um, but with eco turned off, I was really impressed with the acceleration of this car. It's a, uh, it's not a performance car. It wasn't meant to be. It's an economy hatchback. And this, I would bet, could blow any other economy hatchback out of the water. While driving, you can keep an eye on your efficiency 
and um, I've been doing, I guess, 3.2 miles per kilowatt hour since I reset that, but before I reset it, it was about 3.7. So it always has been in the threes. I've never actually seen anything below three, and I have actually been romping on this a decent amount. Yeah, when you really slam on it, it, <laughs> it feels like it pulls to the left or the right a little bit. It just doesn't feel like a super forward, like, here we go. You know, some cars, if you floor it, you almost feel like you could let go of the steering wheel. I don't recommend that, but you feel like the car would just go straight. With the Leaf, I feel like I'm fighting to keep it straight when I'm flooring it from a stop or a really low speed. Of course, up at higher speeds, flooring it barely gives you anything at all, but still enough passing power to do most driving, honestly. It's just fine on the highway. The noise in here actually isn't too bad either for, again, for the price, for the context. I am totally happy with it. There's many quieter electric cars, but there's no engine up in front to add more noise. Now, the front has no frunk, if you're wondering. Uh, a lot of other electric cars have a frunk. That was perhaps a piece of innovation that Nissan missed out on. Instead, you have all the components you need to run the car, <laughs> more or less. So, that's a, yeah, that's a missed opportunity, maybe. I could see adding a little bit of room for a frunk, but Nissan opted not to. Of course, e, the Kia EV6 and Ionic 5 have a tiny frunk. So, I don't know, is no frunk better than a tiny one? But let's go ahead and turn on the Pro Pilot Assist here. There we go. So you get that beep whenever it acknowledges it's taking over steering. Now, the Pro Pilot Assist is decent. I took over there because it wasn't really slowing down in time. I'm gonna go ahead and extend the, uh, what do you call it, the follow distance to the maximum just to make me feel a bit better. <laughs> but we have traffic here. Let's get that back on. So I'll set it to 35 for now. We're only doing less than 20. Gotta love traffic. Looks like it's short-lived. But in theory, this should be doing stop-and-go traffic. Um, so even if we come to a full stop, it should keep going. Although I don't know if it has a timer that it runs out. A lot of cars do that. And then that chime means it lost steering control. So we'll see if it picks that back up again. It is cool that you can have a car this inexpensive with the Pro Pilot Assist function. Um, of course, standard on the Leaf, even on the base one, you have things like blind spot monitoring, um, reverse traffic alerts, and even automatic braking for emergencies and stuff, and lane departure warnings. But to have the actual adaptive um, cruise control with lane centering, you have to opt for an upper trim with Pro Pilot Assist. So upping the speed limit to the actual speed limit of 65. See how this does here. And it's all right, the steering, it kind of is drifting in the lane a little bit, but it still is definitely a, let's see what happens when, there we go. So kind of some aggressive braking there. Um, but the steering does seem to, it keeps you in the lane. It's not like one that like bobs you over the lane, then corrects and then auto overcorrects, and then <laughs> it's not one of those. There's no lane change assist or anything like that, but it's not really something you need, um, especially at this price point. Most other cars that have that are much more expensive. But we're on a graceful turn right here and it's doing it okay. Again, we're kind of drifting towards the left of the lane and then it almost like applies a tiny bit of brakes, it feels like, and then corrects it. It's a very interesting feeling. I really hate the cars that require you to like grab the wheel aggressively to let the car know it's still there. Of course, I still feel like the best way to do that is how Volkswagen did with the ID4, a capacitive steering wheel, so all it has to do is sense, sense the um, energy or electricity from your um, skin, and that's how it knows you're holding onto it. But as for a torque one, this is not bad. CarPlay looks decent acts decent, um, although I have had issues with phone calls. The audio is really, really glitchy, and I can't say that's all Leafs, but for this one, it has never actually done phone calls well through Apple CarPlay. 
As far as power figures, you're talking about 160 kilowatts or 214 horsepower, and the premium, or you know, the plus model, sorry, uh, the bigger battery, 62 kilowatts. And for the smaller battery, you'll find that cut to, uh, I think, 110 kilowatts. So I'm not sure what that is for horsepower, but about 33% less, give or take. So maybe 150 horsepower. I'm not sure, low low hundreds. Enough to get around for sure, but you, I don't know. This one doesn't feel very sporty. It can if you really like send it, but uh, <laughs> I feel like the small battery pack would leave me wanting for more. But for a lot of people who are coming from actual economy hatchbacks, which goes zero to 60 in like 15 seconds, I think it'll be plenty even with the small battery pack. So as I'm approaching the charger, I wanted to point out um, in the screen where it shows you the power and speed limit or speedometer right there, you can also scroll down to see what it thinks the average charging time would be. Um, now this will be interesting because it says around two hours to get to 100% on 50 kilowatt. Of course, you can change what that says. Oh wait, where is it? Menu. Oh, here we go. So I can choose which speed and then it'll tell me the remaining charging time so on a standard like 6.6 .6 kilowatt level 2 charger 10 hours to full 6 to 75 you know three and a half hours to 50 not bad but going back to they have 50 kilowatt quick charge but not a hundred i don't actually know what the top um rating this car will charge but when kyle did his charging test he used a 50 kilowatt chatamo and I am going to a station that supports up to 100 kilowatts over Chatamo. So I'm curious to see what that will do. I don't actually have time to get to the full charge. Um, we just couldn't fit that in with this loan. But um, Kyle already did a zero to 95%. It will probably be similar, but maybe just a bit faster. So I'm looking to see if I can full, or if I can find where I could pull the top speed if it can go over 50 kilowatts. Battery temperature as well, it's good to know. This car, is air cooled not liquid cooled that's another big downside and i would say a strike against any sort of innovation in fact it's literally the opposite of innovation and it can tend to overheat when charging fast when using fast charging so i um yeah it's not a road trippable ev per se maybe really short trips but not uh not a cross-country cruiser if you will so it appears they don't even have this charger, this EVgo King Super is off Sheridan in the map on the car. It also took me a bit to find it. Um, I originally went to POI where it only told me gas stations. <laughs> um, but then I found out if you go to destination, then it shows you charging stations. But that still doesn't find anything. Uh, like, let's see, if we do filter, Quick charging only. Yeah, nothing right near me. So that's interesting. But supposedly all of these have 100 kilowatt Chatamo. So let's find out. That is another thing I think that's a strike against innovation is the fact that this is only Chatamo and not CCS. Um, we used Jalen. So EVgo chargers have fun names. I really like that. Oh, there's a camera at work. And we used Jalen to charge the Mercedes EQS. So let's just use Jalen to charge this. It should work. And this is actually my first Chatamo charging experience. So that's exciting. Nissan has provided us with charging, which is great. I'm gonna pop that. There's a Chatamo. Let's get going.
see what the car says. So I fired up the car and it updated the time remaining to an hour and a half because it's recognizing that it is more than 50 kilowatts. So that's awesome. So you can expect faster charging, still not great for a road trip, partially because of the charging speed, partially because of the energy usage. Uh, this could overheat at some point. Um, it is nice that I'm charging it in the cold. It's 39 degrees, but you can see the battery has actually warmed up since I started charging. So definitely I'd be curious to do a charging test in the hot summer. That's probably something I will aim to do or have Kyle do. So while we're waiting for the charge, uh, I'm not going to be able to charge to full. I just don't have enough time. They're going to pick this car up pretty soon, but I want to look at some of the screens, some of the menus and just see what I think of the UI and maybe what you think of the UI. Um, go to menu here kind of an interesting you know very Nissan not even the newest Nissan just Nissan um, customized home menu oh can throw replace shortcuts this is a very interesting oh audio half size there we go Let's throw the clock right there too. Back. There we go. How about that? And there's the weather, which I do like it when cars show weather. It's just funny that there's serious XM fuel prices. <laughs> so, yep, and stocks even. How about that? No stocks being watched. Okay. And it's funny because that's actually blurred out when you're driving, which is fun. Um, it's fine. I mean, it's just kind of Nissan UI. Not very snappy with this. And this is a 2022 Leaf, so it should be the absolute best. And it's just not, uh, yeah, not the best experience to use. It's, it's okay, it's passable. It actually reminds me of how it worked in my Prius back when I had a Gen 3. Even the map looks the same as the Prius. There's just so many things about this car that I consider as Prius. That's not the correct temperature at all. It does show the correct temperature over here, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. And here that is with CarPlay. Actually, that is really quite bright. It's still very glary though, if you can see there. So if you're looking at it with a certain angle, especially if the sun was like over that direction, bouncing off the screen into your face, that would not be ideal. In my opinion, the ideal screen is more like what's in the EV6, a kind of anti-glare, almost matte finish screen. Love those screens. This just feels like a bit outdated. You can even see the separation between the glass and the LCD panel behind it right there. And at night, there's definitely some light leaking from around the edges. Same with that screen there. So it's it's just not premium per se. We've tapered down to 60 kilowatts at around 43%. So it's just a slow kind of taper down. Still above the 50 kilowatt mark though. It says 17 minutes to get to 75%. Really not bad. And then an incredible hour and a half to get to the 100%. <laughs> the top of this pack charges so incredibly slow. So next to the Chatamo, you have the J1772. So unlike a CCS car where this is just part of CCS, you have two entirely separate connectors, which is why you need this big charging door cover thing. Um, this you can use to get up to 6.6 .6 kilowatts at level two charging, which you can do at home if you have the connector which is an option from Nissan. For a mere $1,600, you can actually get their level two charging cable. It comes in this cool little box here. Pull this out. So there it is, J1772. And the EVSE, no wall box needed, as they say. So pretty cool, pretty nice. I use that at home. I'll put a clip here just showing you how I had that set up to charge at home. You can plug the EVSE into your NEMA 1450, which I have in my garage, uh, which I think they installed upside down actually. But um, if you don't have a NEMA 1450 and you want an electric car, 
I would definitely consider one. This makes it oh, much easier. So, where's that upside down? I really don't know. Uh, if you know, let me know in the comments. <laughs> I could just ask Kyle, but he is, he's out and about. So level two at 240 volt will charge decently well, overnight for sure. Level one uh, with like a 110 outlet will take literally forever if you have a dead battery. Up to two and a half days, Nissan says. But Chatmo is the way to go for this car. I think CCS is the way to go in general, but this will do it. We've ramped down all the way to 54 kilowatts, so just barely above the 50 kilowatt charging that uh, Kyle had done originally. Well, I apologize for the wind. It is very, very windy outside. And it was for Kyle's leaf video too, I think. So <laughs> that's just part of Colorado. Lots of wind and I don't have the mics with me that Kyle used that protects against the wind. But there we have it. Brief little charging session with the leaf. Uh, something you could expect in normal use case. I mean, I went to a grocery store, charged for like 20 minutes, which is when you would be shopping and then left with uh, almost half a battery. That's fantastic. It, you know, jumped up around 70, 71 was the peak I saw, and then it slowly dipped back down. And when I unplugged at 54%, it was right about 50 kilowatts. So I'm guessing that's about when it tapers down below the 50 mark, which is when you can expect Kyle's test to take over the rest of the data. So overall, quite impressed. Um, I still, again, wish it wasn't Chatmo, wish it was faster charging. I mean, if this could do like 150 kilowatts and had CCS, had liquid cooling, there's so many things that could make the Leaf a lot better, but at the same time, it is genuinely a good vehicle for what it is. It's an economy car that works, and that's what a lot of people are looking for. So I guess to sum this all up, um, I wanted to talk about a stereotype and address it. The stereotype of if you are a liberal arts professor at a college or university, you own a leaf. And it's funny because it's often true, um, but there's truth to every stereotype in the fact that a lot of professors are simply sensible people. They want a vehicle or something that just works. They're efficient with their money and they just care about their research. They just want a tool, an appliance to get them from point A to point B. Before the Leaf existed, those people owned a Prius. Um, and some of them may still own a Prius and just added a Leaf to their collection. The Prius is still a great road trip car. It can do a lot more than the Leaf as far as cross country travel. I've done 70,000 miles in a Prius. Um, so the Leaf, in my opinion, acts very similar to the Prius and feels like it captures a lot of that same ethos. It's sensible, uh, it just works, it's relatively efficient, relatively affordable. Um, it, yeah, it just does it. So I feel like, I don't think it's really innovative. At least it's not anymore. It used to be. And so I'll be curious to see what the future of Leaf will be, if there even is a future. The Aria is coming soon. That is definitely a large price bracket above the Leaf. Um, it seems actually overpriced if you ask me. Whereas the Leaf seems very appropriately priced. A maxed out Leaf, still cheaper than most entry level EVs. There's definitely a case to buy it. I came into this vehicle with a lot of hesitation and you know, just wasn't that excited to drive a Leaf. And here I am finding that um, it just works. You know, me and Kyle like to evaluate cars on does it improve your day or not? And can I say neither? <laughs> the Leaf doesn't really improve my day and it doesn't detract from my day. It is literally a, an appliance. Um, we were talking about how it's kind of like a refrigerator you buy, you know, not the fancy one with a screen on it where you can show all your friends all the cool features. It's just a refrigerator. You need one and you don't really care if people see it or not. You don't even think about it. It just works. And that's what this is. So thanks for watching. Thanks for uh, taking a little deep dive on the technology and everything about the Leaf. Very interesting things. Uh, the sound system for one, I mean, that was interesting to research because I had no idea Bose and Nissan partnered up and made an efficient sound system. A lot of innovation went into the Leaf. Not much of it is left to be considered innovation, but we'll see what happens next. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.